The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went toward the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stopping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went in the tomb he saw the linen cloth lying and the napkin which had been on his head not lying with the linen cloth but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they didn't know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ in the risen road. To begin with, allow me to clarify uh, on this Sunday. We are usually calling it the Easter Sunday, but in fact, this is not an Easter Mass. The Easter Mass has been celebrated in the vigil yesterday night. The Easter liturgy is celebrated during the vigil celebration. Today's Mass is, in fact, the first of a series of masses which will be celebrated during the coming 50 days, which are called Paschal period. So the mass which we celebrate is in fact called the mass of the first Sunday of Easter. Actually, next to Sunday, will be the second Sunday 
of the uh, of Easter, the Easter period. Now we come to the readings we have just heard. A reading from the Act of the Apostles, which will be read all through the letter to the Colossians and the version of the resurrection according to St. Uh, John. These readings suggest three different aspects of the Easter message. We read in reading one, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, 37 to 43, it is taken from what they call the charismatic speeches in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. At the beginning of this book, you will see, when you take time to read it, a series of speeches given by St. Peter and others. And here, in the pericope we have just read, St. Peter is proclaiming the death and resurrection of Christ as the final redemptive act of God. But mind you, these charismatic uh, speeches, according to New Testament academics, they are not to be regarded as recorded uh, narratives said by Peter or other. They are only samples of the charismatic uh, teaching, the charismatic teaching. You are not used to that word charisma. Uh, you know the neocatechumenes or neocatechumenate. Those, they know what is the kerygma because they start by that. Kerygma means the teaching the apostles were giving to those new people who are entering the new religion. They had to teach them basics of what they had to know for their faith. So the kerygma is the basic message given by the earliest church in Jerusalem. Uh, we read this kerygma in all the the whole book of the Acts of the Apostles. But St. Luke, St. Luke added something of his own on these speeches. And uh, he has had his hand to shape the actual texts we have. But in the beginning, the charismatic speeches had a following pattern. First, they talked about the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ that culminated in his death, namely in his rejection by the Jewish people who rejected the salvation. Second point in these charismatic speeches it is Christ's resurrection, which was the vindication of God towards Jesus Christ. That is, Jesus proved him to be right. And all the, the works and the deeds, the works and the words Jesus Christ has done in his life. So, the Jesus Christ 
has had with the resurrection, Jesus Christ stood what he, stood, what he has been teaching all through. So the yet, no and yes interpretation of Golgotha and Easter is a characteristic of the earlier church earlier period. The third point of these charismatic speeches is the apostles witness the events right from the beginning of the earthly ministry all through to the appearance of Jesus Christ after his resurrection. Those are the three uh, followed by what they call the kerygma, the basic teaching people were given when they came to embrace faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the first reading in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, we have seen the emphasis on the importance of the apostolic witness. The word witness in our pericope comes back three times, witness. Um, it is important because considered as the only evidence we have for the resurrection. In fact, the witness covers both the earthly life of Jesus and his post-resurrection appearances. No one else can see the risen Christ as the original witnesses who saw him. We know that in the book of the Act of the Apostles, we know that there are subsequent visions like those of St. Paul but the meaning of these visions is not the same. Instead, the Easter appearances are revelatory encounters which founded the church and launched the Christian mission of the church. As such, these appearances belong to the once and for allness of the original saving events and they are unrepeatable. Therefore, our Easter faith depends in the first place solely upon the testimony of the first witnesses. We just have to take them at their word when they proclaim that God raised Jesus from the dead. And once we accept the testimony of these original witnesses, everything begins to come to fall into place. Because our acceptance of the witness will find confirmation in our Christian experience. What we live now, we have it because of those who witnesses the risen Lord. Let us come to the Gospel of St. John, who I've just heard. The story runs as follows. Mary Magdalene came early morning, it was still dark, says St. Saint, Saint John, and went to the tomb and saw that the tomb was open and thought they have taken away the body of the Lord. Then she ran and went to report to Simon and the beloved disciple. They, right away, 
ran to the tomb. When Peter arrived, he saw. Instead, the beloved disciple came, saw, and believed, tells us St. John. In this pericope, in this uh, small passage, we have at least two traditions. The first tradition, the accepted one, is that of Marie Magdalene. This is the well-tested tradition and reliable. The story of Mary Magdalene. This is the first tradition reliable. The second, less reliable, less attested, is the story of St. Peter who ran to the tomb. But we know otherwise that earlier traditions show St. Peter as the first recipient of the appearance of the Lord. He was the first to see the Lord according to ancient traditions and reliable. A less reliable uh, tradition is seen in, the, in St. John where he tells us that Peter ran and the other disciples ran together. This tradition is less reliable. So the other disciple came to faith in the resurrection through the mere sight of the empty tomb. In the earlier tradition, however, the disciple came to faith through seeing the risen Lord, that is, through the appearances of the risen. In front of this confusing amalgam of traditions, the only conviction is that Christ was raised from the dead in accordance with the scripture. To have more clarification, we turn now to St. Luke. In fact, no one among the evangelists relates the actual resurrection of Christ. Has been rising or raised, nobody knows it. That's why the evangelists never say anything because one, there was nobody present when Jesus raised. But the aftermath of the event, this is what they tell us. Second, nobody can relate the resurrection as such because resurrection by its definition is a transformation into an entirely new mode of existence, not a mere resuscitation of the body to the old life, as in the case of Lazarus and others. So the Gospels give us not a narrative of the resurrection, but they give us the witness of the empty tomb. Here, the empty tomb functions as a sign, but a sign is equivocal and susceptible of diverse interpretations, at least two. Either the body has been removed or he has really risen. 
even the arrangement of the linen clothes was not a proof to Peter. He didn't believe. Only the other disciple, disciple came to faith because he perceived the significance of the sign. And in fact, a proof coerces, obliges, but the sign can produce a free decision of faith. In any case, brothers and sisters, it is clear that for the early church, <clears throat> the first Christians, the resurrection faith was grounded not on the discovery of the empty tomb, but in the appearances of the risen road. That is, somebody, a theologian wrote, to faith the empty tomb will be only a sign of what has happened. But the empty tomb cannot give us faith. Finally, we retain this. The Easter message, which is the good news we should have for us 2,000 years after, is one, is that the, is the, the message conveyed by the angel in the Gospel of St. Luke the men in dazzling apparel, the angels, that means the communication from above, the communication from God. And the, this can, in a sense, meet the, the beloved disciples in St. John. The angels communicated, he is not here, he is risen. That's why, brothers and sisters, Christ can only be revealed by God, his Father, to the witnesses as already risen. The church which has believed the proclamation of witnesses proceed to baptize, to teach the word of God, to renew the baptismal vows and to celebrate the Paschal Eucharist, all of which the, is celebrated with the risen Lord. This means that Christ's death and resurrection brought from the past into the present and the future, waiting the second coming. Because the resurrection does not mean that the early ministry of Jesus became a, a fact of the past, the past uh, but a phase now finished. Rather, the resurrection of Christ is the means that all Christ has stood for in his earthly life has reached its end. So Easter is not a recollection of the past event or even a representation in words and sacrament. It is celebra it celebrates our own participation in the risen life initiated in baptism and nourished in the sacrament of the Holy Communion. That is why brother and sisters, all in all, the only proof of the resurrection of Christ is the witnesses, the only proof that Jesus Christ is risen and alive, it is the church, our community. The real proof of Christ living is the Christians, we are here celebrating this Mass, the only proof that Jesus Christ is risen and is alive. Amen.